we're in the middle of a series in this summer called Eight Elephants. So we're dealing with eight hard topics, eight things that are kind of literally the big hairy, uh, well, maybe not literally, metaphorically, they're the big hairy elephant in the room, which means uh, we'd rather not talk about it or we don't know how to talk about it or we're afraid of talking about it. We might use the same, the, the different language. We might say the wrong thing. Um, you know, everything right now is just on edge, if you haven't noticed, in our culture. Uh, and so we've been dealing with how to think about, how should a follower of Jesus think about and talk about various kinds of subjects that that would sort of be found in that hot button area of life. So we've spoken about the authority of Scripture and how do we speak of Scripture as God's Word and do that in the face of a culture that perhaps doesn't believe that. Is Christianity oppressive? Uh, Can we be honest about the way some people have used a cross, but at the same time, uh, is it legitimate to contend that that Christianity is not oppressive, it's actually liberating? Is it true that there's really only one way to God? And if so, uh, where's our foundation for that? Uh, What about gender, sex, and the created order? That's where we left off last time uh, in a world that seems to be very confused by that, where the goalposts keep changing as well as the definition. How is it that followers of Jesus are to be faithful in the middle of that? And today we're going to take up a subject that really, since the almost 248 years come this July 4th, since this nation was founded, really it it came to be a little bit after that, but we tend to to see the signing of the Declaration of Independence as the the, the springboard for that, uh, has been a subject that we've discussed. And that is the relationship between church and state. Generally, there's always been a consensus at the national level that those two ought to be separate, separate meaning that they both ought to be free to pursue the enterprises that God has ordained them uh, to pursue. Not that they should be separate in the sense that one never has anything to do with the other, uh, but when it comes to that second part, what does that look like? Uh, when has when the church gone too far? When has perhaps government gone too far? How should the church view political power. And of course, when you you take that argument, 248 years as it it has existed in our nation now, and you add to it the kind of toxic polarization that our culture is experiencing, many followers of Jesus themselves even being involved in that, you're going to see some movements begin to arise. And one of those is a relatively recent movement called Christian nationalism. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to try to define it because, well, it's got some really bad definitions. And we're going to talk about, is it a good idea? Is it a a bad idea? And so as a result, this is a little bit different kind of message than you're normally going to hear on a Sunday morning. But it's different for this reason. It is said in the Old Testament of the sons of Issachar that they were men who understood the times to know what Israel should do. It's good to know where you're standing. It's good to know when you're standing and how you're going to stand. And and that's difficult to know if if we're not aware uh, of what's going on in culture and perhaps even some ways that the church's corruption might even be threatened in that. And so we're going to talk about Christian nationalism today. Admittedly, an instantly polarizing term. When I uttered it, some of you were probably like, well, what would be wrong with that? And others of you got really negative all of a sudden. You went, oh yeah, those, those people just want to take over everything. And that should indicate to you the multiplicity of ways that this term is understood. So we need to, I've always discovered when there's a term that triggers people that way, and immediately they go into a rage or they embrace something, and and, and it's people who otherwise would love each other, but all of a sudden they have these polar opposite reactions to the same term. Typically the problem is in the definition, And, and what is in order at that point is that we talk about what we're talking about. So let's do some defining as we uh, open up this message here. What is Christian nationalism? The first thing we need to do is define nationalism. What what does it mean for somebody to be a nationalist? Is it right? Is it wrong? Is it evil? Is it oppressive? Is, Is it exactly what a nation needs? Well, even in determining that, it really depends on which kind of nationalism you're talking about. So let's start by just talking about the four general types of nationalism that would exist in a culture. And let's start with the basic. We'll call it civic nationalism. Civic nationalism is more popularly known as patriotism. And it simply means love of country. 
It, it means I love the country. I like the team that's coming back from Vietnam tomorrow. I've been all over the world. I've been privileged and honored to serve Jesus on five continents. Uh, I've had all kinds of food. I've heard all kinds of languages. I've experienced and, and learned so much from the various kinds of culture. Um, but, but when I go to Vietnam or I go to the Middle East or whatever, and I, I've been there for five days, ten days, whatever, and, and I've, I've enjoyed their food and their customs, and it's wonderful, and I'm going to talk to you about it till, you're, till I'm blue in the face when I get back home. But I'm going to tell you, when I get back on American soil, I want myself a dead gum cheeseburger. I just do. Uh, I remember the first time I came back from Vietnam. We had had a Asian food for 10 straight days. It was wonderful, but my digestive system was going, what up, man? What are you doing? Right? I'm not used to this stuff. And we landed and immigrated at Dallas-Fort Worth. And when I came through immigration, the first thing I saw was a TGI Fridays. And the first thing I saw on the menu was a Jack Daniels barbecue bacon burger. And the first thing I said was, God bless America. <laughs> I am glad to be home. Man, I love this country. And, and if you are like me, you know it's more than that, isn't it? I love growing up. I, I love where I've grown up. I, I love the, the nation that I live in. I've had experiences and, and, and uh, since my childhood, people and customs that are familiar to me. And, and, and at a national level, they're wrapped in a flag. And they are. And, and so when I see that flag, I saw a great big one unfurled and, and flowing uh, Friday night at Pittsburgh. I was with my oldest son at a Pirates game. And there we are, hand across the heart singing the national anthem, and I was instantaneously thankful to live in this country. And I'm not just thankful for it, but I'm thankful for it to the point that I want to see it flourish. That's what you call patriotism. Now, when you go to the voting booth this November, some of y'all may have very different opinions about how that country's going to flourish. That's okay. But if you love America, you're thankful for America, and you want to see America flourish, you're a patriot, otherwise known as a civic nationalist. And I would contend not only is that permitted in Scripture, it's endorsed. It's endorsed. We see that in Jeremiah when he speaks to the people. And he says, in, in Babylon, another nation, now I've put you here. This is where you are. And he makes two things very clear to them. Number one, this is not your ultimate home. All right, so don't put all your hope in it. But number two, this is going to be your home for the rest of your life. So get a mortgage, take wives, give your children away to daughters and sons-in-law, and seek the welfare of the place where I put you. That, it, seek its good. Love it. That's another way of saying love it. So if you love your country and you're a patriot, you're a civic nationalist. That's okay. In fact, that's endorsed by Scripture. Then there's another kind of nationalism called economic nationalism. And there's probably, I would imagine... Uh, some different opinions about that in the room. If you're positive toward it, uh, you may use another term for it. You, you may use a term like protectionism. Uh, or if you hear a phrase out in popular culture like America first, it, it makes you feel good because you think, yep, that's true. Because Now, if you're negative toward it, this started in, in really more politically libertarian spaces where it, it rested for decades. Now it's leaked over mostly into the conservative side of our political debates. Um, but, but if you're negative toward it, you might call it isolationism. But what you need to know about economic nationalism is it's not ultimately a moral, and certainly not a religious argument, it's a mathematical one. It's an economic one. And on that issue, there's a lot of freedom for Christians to have different opinions about what happens and what's the healthiest way. So you could have two people that are civic nationalists, one that's not an economic nationalist and one that is, but they both love their country. They just have two different opinions about the best way to see it flourish. This making sense so far? Okay, everybody good? So civic nationalism, economic nationalism. The third one is, is ethnic nationalism. Uh, and given the demographic reality of the United States, another term for that would be white nationalism. And it says, it's been around for a while, raises its ugly head every so often, as it's done probably in the last five or six years, that America is a white Protestant European-based country with white European-based culture, and that that should be protected at all costs. It's alluded to approvingly uh, in the preeminent volume, Advocating Christian Nationalism, published just last year by a scholar named Stephen Wolf, and the nicest thing I can say about it is that it's racist and that there's absolutely no place in that kind of mindset in the mind of a follower of Jesus. Just absolutely none. Now, 
The last form of nationalism is what we're going to talk about today, religious nationalism. And since America began as and still consists majority of people who would call themselves Christian, uh, then we can't just merely and vaguely say religious nationalism. We have to specifically say Christian nationalism. I have a colleague named Paul D. Miller, a research fellow at the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission on the faculty at Georgetown, and, and I really don't think his definition can be improved upon. He says, Christian nationalism is the belief that the American nation is defined by Christianity and that the government should take active steps to keep it that way. Popularly, Christian nationalists assert that America is and must remain a Christian nation, not merely as an observation about American history. In other words, any honest historian would say the majority of our founders were Christian people and that Christian values certainly influenced the country. Okay, But he said the Christian nationalist wants to take it further than that as a prescriptive program for what America must continue in the future. And then Miller will go on in his book to quote additional scholars like Samuel Huntington who say that America is defined by its Anglo-Protestant past and we will lose our identity and freedom if we do not preserve our cultural inheritance. Now here's what I want to point out right at the first. Did you hear the fear in that? Here's what I want to remind you of, my brothers and sisters. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So if your political involvements, your partisan loyalties, your media intake, whatever kind of poison you choose, ends and you find yourself always afraid or in a rage or motivated to hate somebody else, that did not come from God. It came from hell even if it came from somebody that agrees with you. This isn't how it works, okay? If you find yourself immersed in something and every time you walk away from it, it leaves you fearful or angry or outraged or tempted to hate. Whatever that is didn't come from God. That is not Christian. That is not something you ought to have anything else to do with. You ought to run from that the same way you would a Ouija board because it's doing the same thing to your mind. Fear. Fear. Our current body politic funds itself billions of dollars a year on both sides by fear. Christ followers are called to a higher plane than that. And just the fact that, that this movement capitalizes on fear makes it dangerous to believers in Jesus who also happen to live in the United States of America. Now, I'm going to expound in a bit on, on why that is. But before I do that, let me qualify everything I've just said and everything I'm about to say going forward. Because as I mentioned at the outset, you say the word Christian nationalism and, and people tend to have different understandings of exactly what that is. So we need to define it, uh, beginning with what it's not. Because while on the far right, there's this temptation to utilize this to grab hold of power in an oppressive way, on the far left, this term has been used as a dog whistle. Uh, in the sense that if, if somebody says something that, that you don't particularly like and you're more progressive, you just label it Christian nationalism so that you don't have to substantively deal with it, all right? So, so let me tell you some things that this movement is not. Number one, Christian nationalism is not leveraging your faith in the public square, all right? Leveraging your faith in the public square. Well, you shouldn't bring faith into the public square. Well, then there would be no public square as we know it now. If for no other reason than faith, whether it's our faith or someone else's faith, really constitutes the deepest and most substantive part of who someone is. If you're not allowed to join that voice with the voices of others, including those who may not agree with you, in order to find some national consensus, that is both oppressive and un-American. You can't do that. Furthermore, I'll just tell you, without the voices of faith in this country, this country's never been codified as a Christian nation. I'm going to get to that in a minute, and I'm also going to tell you why it would be a really bad idea for us to do that. But we'd be stupid to ignore that without the influence of faith communities, primarily Christian faith communities, we would have never seen the abolition of slavery. We would have never seen the ascent of the civil rights movement. We would have never had a, a dynamic public school system anywhere. We would have never built universities and hospitals. There would have never been child labor laws. So much of that is the result of Christian morality and Christian influence on the nation. And I know what some of you are thinking, wait a minute, it, didn't some Christians advocate slavery? Yeah, those were my ancestors and they weren't Christian. 
I'm talking about the real thing, all right? The Confederacy was another form of this Christian nationalism. I'm going to talk about another sermon for another day. But let's get things straight. Let's talk about the gospel and what it is, and let's talk about cultural Christianity and what it is. But when you leverage your faith in the public square, that's not Christian nationalism. Pastor, what about the separation of church and state? I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Number two, being a political conservative is not Christian nationalism. This ludicrous statement that if you're a registered Republican, somehow that makes you a theocrat. Just... People, let's have a serious conversation because that one's not. It's just not. And, and it's proven by Christian nationalist scholars themselves who will tell you, Stephen Wolf, among the, the chief of them, that they believe modern conservatism is part of the problem as well, that it's dead and that the conservative movement has failed. And what we need now is a new civic order that is guided by the word of God. Sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds good. Pastor, you're opposed to that with all my heart. Why would you oppose to, be opposed to that? Because we are impotent to do it. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. If we try it, we're going to jack it up. This is not God's intention for earthly civil government. And I'll tell you why that is, again, in just a minute. But for now, being a political conservative is not, that doesn't make you a Christian nationalist. Number three, being a patriot, hopefully we've covered that earlier, it is not something that makes you a Christian nationalist. There's a lot of fear even on the part of some believers uh, that, that we can't participate in, in those patriotic processes because somehow it might give the impression uh, that we're, we're making an idol out of our country. And listen, you, you can idolize your country. It can absolutely happen. But I have a pastor friend of mine in Tallahassee, Florida, who was telling me about a year ago, he said, my sixth grade son is one of 20% of kids in a largely Christian place, like most of the people that go to church who will actually stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. And he said, I've been talking to some of the neighbors, and they're like, yeah, we're just afraid of what that might look like or, or, or what that might mean. or, or what that, It just means you love your country. That's all it means. It doesn't mean that, that your country has become your Lord. It, it doesn't mean anything like that. Twenty. Four out of five students in a middle school that just won't do this? Where are you going to have solidarity to bring your culture together? How are you ever going to find consensus if there's not something uh, around which that we can, can rally together? And, and so doing that doesn't make you a Christian nationalist. I had a progressive uh, sister tell me the other week, said, you know, I, I love my country, I want to be, but I'm getting to the point, I wonder, should I fly my flag? And I'm like, why? Why would you not want to do that? Because I'm afraid somebody's going to think I'm a Christian nationalist. And I'm like, sister, that flag is yours every bit as much as it's theirs. Fly that sucker. Fly it. So being a patriot doesn't make you a Christian nationalist. Voting conservative doesn't make you a Christian nationalist. None of these things do. So how do you recognize this? Typically, it's about some elements that you will find in speech, in any kind of legislative process that one might go through, but I want to give you three contours that you will find, and this is something that maybe some of us have been guilty of in the past, and we need to watch for these kinds of things. Number one is a conflation of kingdoms. When you get the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God conflated, you have royally messed things up. And I'll tell you where this takes place at for really more frequently than anywhere else. It is the conflation of the ancient nation state of Israel with the United States of America. It's a huge hermeneutical blunder. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. And then the last phrase of that says, I will hear, I will heal their land. When you see that verse attached to an American flag, at the very best, you've got somebody thoroughly confused about how to apply that passage. Number one, the people he's referring to there is Israel, not Americans. And number two, the people even within Israel were his people. Because as we were later, would later find out, not everyone who is of Israel is of Israel, right? And so if my people will do this. So how do you apply that in 2024? I'm looking at them. I'm looking at them. Our brothers and sisters in Asia, same thing. If they will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. Now, why is that such an exegetical blunder? Why, why is that so important? 
Because if you make this about a modern nation state, you conflate a temporary kingdom with an eternal kingdom. That brings me to number two, which is conflation of nations. And again, this is slightly related because you're still taking Old Testament passages related to Israel and believing that they can be applied to the United States. Let me tell you something about that ancient nation state of Israel that you read about in your Old Testament and mine. Israel, according to Scripture, was a nation unique in its existence and purpose among and above any other nation that has or ever will exist in human history. Those of us who are followers of Jesus believe that she completely fulfilled that purpose when she gave Jesus to the rest of us. That's what we believe about Israel. There has never been and there never will be again in the history of the world another nation like ancient Israel. There just won't be. And, and so when we start taking promises applied to that nation in that context and we begin to move it over and, and, and make application to a modern nation state less than 250 years old that, that really is, is, whose laws and government are based on an amalgam of all the great civilizations. I don't know if you realize this or not, but next time you go to the National Mall, just, just take a look at the architecture. The Lincoln Memorial is Greek. The Washington Monument is Egyptian. The nation's capital is Roman. You think that's an accident? Our founders built that in that way in order to demonstrate by virtue of the architecture of our nation's capital that we were building on all of the great empires in the past with the goal of building the greatest empire the world has ever seen. That was the goal. I think to a large extent they pulled it off. I think they did. I'm grateful to live in it. It's not Israel, not even close, okay? So just something to think about there. Conflation of kingdoms, conflation of nations. If there is a corresponding ancient nation to the United States of America, it's not Israel. It's either Rome or Babylon. Take your pick, okay? And there were good things about Babylon, good things about Rome, evil things about Babylon, evil things about Rome. We've, we've got to get our history right and, and our philosophy of history right if we're going to understand what this looks like. Because when you conflate the U.S. and Israel, you take a nation that's more like Rome or Babylon and you presume to think that you can turn that into some kind of God-ruled society. Okay, And that's what gets us in a mess. Here's the third contour of Christian nationalism. It's a confusion of history. The most notorious figure in this is a man named David Barton. Uh, he's written a lot of books. Uh, actually, he wrote a book called The Myth of Separation uh, and how nation, you know, we just need to be a Christian nation. He, he fancies himself a historian, although I will tell you he, he gets laughed out of a lot, of a lot of historically academic circles, including evangelical ones. Ask my friend Dr. Nathan Finn, who's the provost at my alma mater, North Greenville University, and an historical theologian, or Dr. Thomas Kidd, formerly the department chair of history at Baylor University, now teaching that same subject at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and you will get the deepest kind of eye roll out of both of those men when you bring up the name David Barton, because he's not a historian. He's a hack, but he's popular because a lot of what he says tickles ears. Paul said something about that to Timothy. He said, watch out for people who tell you what you want to hear. It's a very selective history of the United States that when he's done would make you think the nation's founders were all a bunch of revivalist preachers in love with Jesus. It's, it's ridiculous. It really is. And, and we should oppose falsehood, people, wherever we discover it. But especially when it comes from someone claiming to know and serve the cause of Jesus. The truth is the American story is complex. It's highly complex. Uh, but, but we like simple, don't we? And, and so we're tempted by one of two highly generalized narratives. And, and in recent years, we've, we've given a, a numeric value to those narratives. There's a 1776 narrative and a 1619 narrative. Have y'all been paying attention to this? The 1776 narrative lionizes everything about this country. The 1619 narrative demonizes everything about this country. You're like, well, which is true, Pastor? Both. They're both true. Because this is a great country. And this has in the past and continues in the present to sometimes be a wicked country. 
It just, it, it, it's what it is, okay? And so whether you, when you see those three things, conflation of kingdoms, conflation of nation, confusion of history, there's a pretty good chance Christian nationalist thinking has invaded that space. So here's the next question. Well, pastor, why is that bad? Why, why would we not want God's word to rule over us? Well, for the, church, for the church, that's exactly what we want. But for a nation like the United States, there's a number of reasons why we really ought to pump the brakes on this. And let me give you those, and then we'll get to Daniel chapter 2 just briefly. Number one, and this is pretty obvious, but it needs to be said. This isn't heaven. This is earth. All right? Our job is not to bring the kingdom of God to earth. Our job is to represent that kingdom until Jesus brings it to the earth. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says that we are ambassadors. You know what an ambassador does? They faithfully live and speak in a way that represents a coming kingdom that one day is going to swallow up all the others, including this one. And when we try to short-circuit that by establishing the kingdom of God through our own power, yeah, I'm going to tell you something we're doing, whether we realize it or not. We are presuming to do something that God alone has said, that's mine to do, not yours. You don't get to do that. I will do it. I think one of the reasons, and we'll get to this in a moment, is he knows we'll mess it up. Because every time it's ever been tried in human history, it's gotten messed up. Okay? So you don't want to do that. Number two, because Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. That was the rallying cry of the first century church. And then, I'll tell you what, what puzzles me a little bit, because I grew up, and so you don't have to agree with me, but I, I grew up in South Carolina, and from the time I was about 10 years old all the way up, really, even in my adulthood, I mean, I, I grew up in a, in a really kind of a Reagan Republican household. Don't hate me for that if, you don't, if you're not that, one of those people. But, but it's, it's, here's what I learned growing up. I, I always thought, and this is what puzzles me, that this is a temptation not of the left but of the right, because on the right, there's a conservative movement that is always taught, at least in this country, that we believe in small, limited government. I'm not sure how this squares with small, limited government. To be American, even if you were liberal, meant for the longest time that we all agreed the absolute least qualified entity on planet Earth to do theology was the government. Can we just say that? I got to tell you, every time I, politician, Republican, Democrat, local, national, anywhere in between, anytime they start quoting scripture, I throw up a little bit in my mouth. I do. Because nine times out of ten, they don't mean it. They don't even know what it means. They're trying to leverage it to get you to sign on to their policy initiative, which is another way of saying they're taking the Lord's name in vain. And we should not have anything to do with that. Don't do that. Putting the Declaration of Independence in a Bible. As an Assembly of God preacher in his 80s said, and I, man, I thought, man, that's a phenomenal way to put it. How much gall do you have to have to take a government document that keeps referring to the people and the for the people and by the people and, and put it in with the same Bible that says all things are from him and to him and through him? What blasphemy is that? Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. You say, well, well, we don't want Caesar. Jesus will take care of Caesar. It's okay. He'll take care of Caesar. But when you use the law to try to establish a religion, you violate consciences of people that don't believe like you do, and then it becomes a struggle for power. Does this sound familiar? And then what's going to happen at some point is they're going to get it. And then we're going to be on the business end of it. That, that's what happens. That's otherwise called oppression. And so the answer for that is for Christians to believe that Jesus alone is Lord of the human conscience. Government has no business violating the conscience of an individual. It's what we believe. We're, we're, our roots are Baptists. It's what we believe for 300 years. Every time in history that Caesar has tried to take the place of either the church or the Lord of the church, not only has he gotten this wrong, but lots of people, including our Christian brothers and sisters, have suffered for it. Here's the third reason we need to pump the brakes. Jesus wants us on the margins, not in power. All right? 
At every turn during his earthly life, he resisted the call of his own disciples to accumulate political power and influence. So what now? Sam Hill are we doing in 2024 looking for it? Why are we doing that? The greatest warning about the lust for power is actually found in a text that intrigues and fascinates a lot of people. It's in Revelation 13, 18. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. I got that back in cash at uh, a restaurant here in town a few weeks ago. $6.66, and the waitress looked at me frightened and said, can I give you another penny? (laughs) That's not really what this is about, though. All right. You got to look at the wider context. And you'll see John is describing through this number the identity of the second beast. There's two characters in this context. The first beast is from the sea. The the second is from the earth. And they're working signs and miracles. Too many people think of the mark of the beast and they think about it as a threat. You either take this or we're going to chop off your head. You either take this or we're not going to let you buy or sell. Those, Those kinds of things. But what we forget is there's a woman riding one of those beasts. And John defines her as a whore. That's what he says about her. What's he saying? He's saying this isn't some threat. This is seduction. This isn't somebody coming against you. Jesus said you'll be hated by people for my name's sake. That's part of the game if you sign up for this. This is when you hear somebody that agrees with you, when you hear somebody that says things that trip your trigger. You've got to be careful around those things. Be very, very careful. Because that's how Satan operates, by attraction, by seduction, telling you what you want to hear, promising you power and influence and access, which is exactly what Rome offered the first century church if they would simply comply. But here's the other thing you need to know. Never in its 2,000-year history has there been a single time when the church has pursued and attained political power that it actually became powerful. It lost its power. It lost its saltiness. It lost its savor. It lost its uniqueness. So Jesus, in this final apocalypse, says says to his people everywhere, which includes us people, the margins are where I want you. Because the margins are how people see that only I get glory when you are victorious. The margins are... As a result, or where you're going you're gonna to find real victory. Guys, I'm, here's where I say something very, very direct. That is precisely the opposite message that you hear from dominionism, from the Seven Mountain Movement, from the Moral Majority, from Turning Point USA. Every dead gum one of them will tell you, we need power, we need influence. And Jesus just told you, actually, that's how you lose your soul. So you're either going to believe Charlie Kirk or you're going to believe Jesus. It's just going to be one of the two. He wants us on the margins. Here's the final reason. America is neither Israel nor the church. So much of the biblical justification for Christian nationalism equates the U.S. with ancient Israel. You can thank a guy named Charlie Draper for this. He was a, a mentor and a professor of mine. And he said, there's only two nations that I know of in the history of the world that ever suffered from such acute cases of chosen people syndrome. One was ancient Israel and the other is the United States of America. Both were incredibly full of themselves. And the only distinction between them is that between Israel and the United States, Israel's the only country that actually had a legitimate reason to feel that way. Perspective. Perspective. What, what does this look like? Right? So how do, we, how do we relate to the civic order? And this is where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move real quickly. But I want to just go back to Daniel and look at his example. Because he's out of the theocracy. He's in Babylon. And at the same time, his skills were noticed. He was trained for high office. He was faithful to food, Jewish food laws. But he didn't compromise his faith. But he also studied Babylonian literature and science. And he contributed to the welfare uh, of his nation. And, and what we find here is a disposition that led him in all the ways that he served his country of residence. Three things. Number one, be honest about your country, wherever you find yourself. Chapter 2, verse 20. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might 
He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. This is the truth. Daniel's saying God in his wisdom has brought this mighty nation of Babylon into being. And when he's done with it, he will dispose of it. And there's nothing he didn't say about Babylon that is not also true about the nation that you and I inhabit. I love America. I love this great country. I, I am one of those people that in the spirit of Churchill think it's the worst country in the world except for all the others. That's what I believe. All right. I love living here. But I'm going to tell you something. Mightiest nation that has ever existed in all of human history. And when God decides he's done with this nation, he will dispose of it. He will not lose a second sleep over it. It will not face him. And if we don't understand that or if we're offended by that, we are way too full of ourselves as a nation of people, which is a, something that really ought to scare us. God raises nations up. God brings nations down. You think this country was started by Jefferson and Madison? God raised this nation up. And when he is done with it, he'll dispose of it. You mean God doesn't? God loves you. God loves people. God uses nation states. But he loves people. We got to know the difference. We got to be honest about that. And when we have that perspective, we can be realistic about our nation. Verse 22, he reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. Which means my hope is not in the continuance or improvement, or not, neither is my, my despair found in the destruction of a nation state or a civilization. My hope is in the Lord. Love your country. Desire good for your country. Don't ever place your ultimate hope there. Okay? When, when Christian leaders try to sell you, this is timely because it's 2024. I'm not sure if all of you are aware, but there's an election coming. Okay? Uh, and you're going to have, you're, it, this is the thing that really just makes me want to vomit. It, it's not even the political candidates because they are who they are. All right? It, it's like they can't help themselves from the local level all the way on up. Politicians going to politic. All right? But when preachers politic, I get sick to my stomach. Especially when they utter a phrase like this. This is the most important election. You feel that fear well up a little bit? Yeah. Feel that anger at the other side well up a little bit when they say that stuff? That didn't come from God. I don't care what their name is. I don't care what organizations they run. That doesn't come from God. Watch yourselves in the middle of that, okay? Don't believe it. There's a higher kingdom. Whether this nation stands or falls before Jesus returns, all right? Loving my country in proper perspective means recognizing that a day is coming when Jesus will rule over a world where it doesn't exist anymore. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. We either believe that or we don't. That's a realistic picture that puts America in its place. And when you've done that, you can do this last thing. Seek its welfare. Verse 23, to you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might and have not made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Daniel says, I know how to help, and I'm going to help. I'm going to help. That, that's what we should do. More particularly, love this temporary kingdom that God has given us and as best you can contribute to its success. And yes, that means leveraging your faith. So, so if you're more progressive and, and you're tempted to go, wait a minute, we can't legislate morality, please do not pretend as though you believe those words that just actually came out of your mouth. You know there's laws against murder, right? Stealing. Those have a moral basis. There's not a law on the books that doesn't have a moral basis. Please come to me with a serious argument. Of course you can legislate morality. And we've got to do some more of that. We've got to do more on the human trafficking front. We absolutely must do something to eliminate pornography as the scourge of this country. I got, I'm sitting in too many offices with too many men and women now. It has absolutely overcome our brains. It is a national public health crisis. 
Forget about what the Bible says about it, although the Bible says plenty. There's a lot we can do to link arms in there. We need to care for unborn children. I'll be talking about abortion in the coming weeks. We need to care for the poor and the widow and the immigrant. And we need to do that in common sense ways, of course. That, that doesn't mean you lob on to every legislative move that claims to do something. But, but those, are the, those are the dispositions of a Christian's heart. How do we do those things? And Scripture would commend we leverage our faith to access and address those things in the public square with anybody we can link arms with in civil society to get it done. We should vote. We should involve ourselves in the process. You should start local because we're in a federal system. Okay? The top of the ticket is nowhere near the most important vote you'll make this coming election season. Another time, place, ask me whatever you want. I'll answer it, but not now. And you do all of that, not because this is your ultimate home, but because you do it as an ambassador of Christ, as a, as a kingdom. And here's the thing. When it, when it comes to Christian nationalism, I'm not afraid for the country, okay? I, I'm not. I, I, I fear for the clarity of the gospel and the presence of the kingdom in this country. And, and whether it will be faithfully represented by the people in front of me and by people like me. Because forms of this nationalistic tendency have risen up over the last 2,000 years. Not a single time that has ever been tried has it succeeded. And it's beginning to rise now on a global scale. It's not just here in the United States that we're seeing the rise of the, the appeal to a strong man or an authoritarian leader. We're seeing this in other places like Hungary and Argentina and Russia and Italy. And everywhere it emerges with a cross emblazoned on it, it corrupts the Christian gospel. It compromises Jesus' followers. And in the end, not what they intended, but this is what they're going to get either way. It increases oppression, including oppression of Christians. Because eventually, if you're going to start a Christian nation, you're going to get to this inevitable question, whose Christianity are we talking about? Who gets to decide? And now you just put that question in the hands of the same people who run the DMV. <laughs> not very bright people. All right. You know what? DMV's been good to me the last couple of years. Let me give them a shout out right now. Y'all are doing a lot better than y'all were when I first got here. Still, I don't want you doing theology at the DMV. Right? I don't, I don't want that. Here's the big idea. When humans try to use the state as their weapon, they're playing God. And that's not something a Christian ought to ever do. And that's where we find ourselves. Outside of Israel herself, God never blesses a nation state, but he does bless his people when they're obedient. So do you love America? When you see that flag unfurled at a baseball game or a football game this fall, or some of you, God bless you, thank you for your service in our military. You see it unfurled every morning during training. Do you want to see the nation symbolized in that flag, prosper? You want to see her get better? Then live obediently in worship of Jesus, the King of Kings. Raise your children to do the same. Encourage your neighbors to do the same. Invite your friends and, and co-workers to do the same. And in those actions, demonstrate your heart's desire that God would bless America. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, you are gracious to us in giving us a wonderful place to live. There is freedom and prosperity and all of the things that are allowing us even now to do the things we're doing in this community and around the world. We don't take that for granted. We're incredibly grateful for it. But Lord, our disposition needs a check right now in the midst of forces and voices all around us trying to pull us into a culture war under the banner of taking over power structures. And Father, may we just remember that when you walked this earth, you repeatedly reminded us that your kingdom was not of this world. If it was true when you're here, it is certainly still true when you are no longer on this earth, but on that throne at the right hand of your Father. And so God, give us clarity. May we never compromise our faith for the left or for the right or anywhere in between. May we be true to who we are. And may we, because you've commanded us, this is the place where you've sovereignly put us. And we thank you for the United States of America as a result of that. And God, may our disposition in all these things bring her to prosper. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.